Fest is back. The two-day rock and roll party leading up to the original Kiss Cruise will be on October 27th and 28th in the City of Angels, Los Angeles, California. Proudly brought to you by Kiss Rum, Kiss Cold Gin, and Yamaha. Day one festivities will be a Bon Voyage party held at the host hotel, the Double Tree in San Pedro, hosted by the one and only DJ Noise. Party with your fellow cruisers while Noise spins the tunes and mingle with our special musical guests. Then stay for the Cruise Fest Comedy, Punchlines and Backlines Comedy Show, produced and hosted by Courtney Cronin Dole. Featuring one of Hollywood's funniest rock and roll comedians, plus a Kiss Army fan favorite headliner and a special guest rock star doing their first stand-up comedy set. Day 2 features a five-band live show at the historic Yost Theater featuring tribute bands Fair Warning and Dress to Kill, along with the Iron Maidens and headliners Slaughter. Plus, a special performance by the original members of Fraley's Comet, Todd Howarth, John Regan, and world-renowned drummer Anton Fig. All this, plus charity raffles generously sponsored by Sixth Man. Don't miss this exciting event. Start your rock and roll vacation off at the only party in town, Cruise Fest. That's Cruise Fest with a K. my friends, and welcome to episode 70 of the Kiss Army Nation podcast. We are your hosts. I'm Pasquale Berry. And I am Claudius Perra. Welcome to the show, everyone. On this discussion panel, we welcome our panel guests, Craig Patton and Patrick de Montigny. Welcome back to the show, gents. Hey, guys. Thanks for having us on. Considering that this episode we will be putting our focus on Kiss music, please let me ask you which record have you been spinning lately? Any bootleg of the Sunboard release or any particular record from the from the catalog? Craig, what have you been listening to? Uh, since I've been doing my homework, uh, <laughs> I've been listening a lot to uh, Creatures era, um, Creatures of Night. I mean, I rewatched the Rio show. Uh, it's just a phenomenal time for me. That's uh, that you know it didn't sell out, but I, I just thought it was a a really cool time for them. Okay, okay. So the the I guess uh, the the original creatures, not not the uh, release from '85, right? So it's uh, yeah, the original one, yeah, the original one. Okay. And you, Pat? Well, as for myself, it's totally well. No, it's still in the family, so to speak. Uh, I've been listening to the Ace releases, later Ace releases, uh, Anomaly, uh, oh. Space uh, Space Invader, uh, and the other one, uh, Spaceman. And uh, I, because I've listened to each about one or once or twice, so if I'm gonna give them another spin to see and. Uh, yeah, enjoy them pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. How did so you that's like what them? I've been listening to lately. You, you like them better now? Yeah. Say that again. Did you like them then? Did you yeah. like them like yeah. better now than before? Yeah. You, it's. I think we don't listen to the music the same way as when we were kids, so uh, it takes a little more time for us to digest it. So, but in the end, I think it's a yeah. I'm really happy with them. Nice. Nice. Yeah. yeah. You ask anything in particular? You've been uh, spinning. Uh, recently, Donington, the off the soundboard. Okay, I've been mm-hmm. on. I've been on the off, off the soundboard kick lately. I've been listening to all of them, and then going okay. back. And no, it's. Uh, I, I. I really. I really enjoy that. Uh, that series. Even again. Even. Uh, 
Even Virginia, Virginia Beach, not not, because, not not so bad, not so bad. There's mm -hmm. always something special with each of these mm -hmm. each of these mm -hmm. releases, and I'm so looking forward to the next one. It's gonna be oh, yeah. annoying. Oh, yeah. It's gonna oh, be yeah. amazing. Oh yeah, amazing. <laughs> so, in a, so in a sense, I'm listening to these albums, anticipating the next one. There you go there, you go. And how about you? Uh, yeah, me too. I've been uh, I've been spinning uh, off the soundboard, and um, I I gave uh, you know many many times to to Donington and then uh, Tokyo, but uh, you know Donington and uh, I, I don't know. There's something about the reunion tour that uh, actually it's it's it got me. You know, I I, I listened to the, the you know the set list and the, the way they they were playing those songs. I love it. I love it, and it has a great sound. By the way, it has a great sound. Yeah, I really like it. All right. Okay. Guys. So before we uh, get on our topic, I want to ask an off the topic question, sort of. I want to get your points of view on music producer Michael James Jackson, who unfortunately passed away recently. Uh, what do you think of Michael's main contributions to history? Craig? Um, listen, I, I know he was the 80s album producer. I know that. Um... For example, he, he gave a special sound to the like, Creatures in the Night, you know. From what I read and heard that he put mics all over the room. That's how you get that big sound, that big drum sound, that he had put mics all over the place. And he introduced them to a lot of different co-writers during that album. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them being our fellow Canadian, uh, Brian Adams. And um, I, I think that also, you know, he did other bands such as, you know, LA Guns and stuff like that, that that brought that that sound i guess to kiss or whatever and then you know kiss was floundering at that time and i think that he you know tried to make it back back to with the roots but it was funny once he said something like uh, i remember uh talking with Vinny, and he says that Vinny was the v factor in the band <laughs> you know <laughs> but we all know what the v factor is right so uh, but i i think that listen um i i think that it, you know he made it more of a complicated kiss album it, it was more uh, than just you know go in the studio and cut an album it was it was direction it was co-writing it was let's let's get back on track here guys you know yeah mm -hmm. all right patrick what do you think i mean i think uh in order for them to get back to their roots uh funny enough i think they needed to get some new blood uh, in order for them to maybe have someone who has more fresh eyes and say look this is what you need to do you need to i think their decision was already made after the elder to say okay we're going to go back to what we did before on steroids and mm -hmm. i think uh, with the uh, lick it up and uh creatures it was mission accomplished and i think michael james jackson played a big role in that because i don't think after that he was involved with this and we can tell on animal eyes and the other albums that something was lacking and i had uh, had he been there for those records, we might have had something a little different. Mm -hmm. So it was very important to Kiss's return to the metal, if I like to use that term, uh, the, the metal uh, sound. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. definitely. Claudio, yeah, f fully agree with uh, with Pat, with uh, with Pat. You know, I, I think uh, he's uh, he has a significant you know impact on 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 Kiss story. Uh, mainly, you know, because of of the of the commercial, you know, uh, downturn of of the elder, and then you know, bringing the, the band back uh, with a beautiful sound. So I really love, you know, the sound that the creatures has. It's one of my favorites. And then I think he did a great job with um, with uh, lick it up. Uh, you know, a new guitar. Well, new guitar. We know that uh, Vinny was already part of of of, uh, of uh, creatures, but uh, it sounds different to me, you know, even Lick It Up, it sounds different than, than Creatures, but I love those two albums. I, I think uh, he, he, he left uh, his stamp, you know, in history big time. So, uh, yeah, a big loss. And he seemed, to, he seemed to have a very strong relationship with, uh, with the Kiss Camp. You know, uh, you know nice comments from, from the band when, when, uh, during, when he passed. And uh, he seemed to be really close to fans too. A very humble man, and um, but yeah, so a very important part of history. What about you, Pask? You know, there's a lot of discussion online about who saved Kiss. Uh, did Paul save Kiss? Did Vinny save Kiss? Did Bruce Kulick save Kiss? I don't know. It's a, it's a complicated question. 
But I think one of the people I think that helped save Kiss uh, was Michael James Jackson. He did the impossible after, after Unmasked and The Elder to bring Kiss back to form with the amazing album that was Creatures was an, was an incredible feat. And the album didn't do very well financially then. But, you know, if you look back in history, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment, an amazing oh, yeah. album that is up there with one of the best. And I dare say, if it wasn't for him, what would have happened to Kiss at that time? That album was absolutely needed. And, right. then, and then the makeup comes off and there's another challenge. How is Kiss going to maintain their longevity without makeup? And out comes uh, Lick It Up, another huge accomplishment uh, by this producer who, again, redefined Kiss without makeup. Uh, I don't know any producer who would want to touch that album at that time with that kind of transition that the, that the band was going through. And he was up to the challenge. And boy, did he make it work. So when I hear that argument, who saved Kiss? There's no one individual person, but he's definitely one of the people who, like you've all said, has a huge contribution to Kiss Tree. I agree. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, definitely. You know, that, that's that's what I love about, you know, these discussions. I, I, I never thought of that. You know, uh, as, as you were speaking, Pascal, it's true. You know, uh, it's a big thing to say that he's, he, he basically helped to save, to save Kiss, but going from, from the makeup era to the, to the non-makeup, it was a big deal for Kiss and uh, he did a great job. Yeah, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Good, great, thank you. Thank you guys. So now we're gonna, we're gonna get deep into the, into the topic for this episode. So we will kick off a new section, which goes a bit deeper into uh, Kiss related music and a little bit of uh, minutia, uh, but keeping our unique uh, debate format. So um, this time around, uh, we will concentrate on two heavyweight producers that are a huge part of the band's music legacy. So we will be discussing uh, Eddie Kramer and Bob Etherin. Uh, gents, general thoughts about the topic? Pat, do you want to start? Sure, uh, I love that topic because uh, I think, you know, producers play a bigger role in a band's career than we might think because different producers have different sounds, uh, like a trademark sound. And uh, sometimes it suits the artist, sometimes it doesn't. So I love that topic for sure because I think Bob Ezrin and Eddie Kramer brought a lot to the table, to the KISS table. Absolutely. Craig? Well, we have two ends of the spectrums here. I think that uh, Kramer did it when he, he did it with the earlier albums and created that, uh, that sound, right? So, and, and sometimes he had to do it with two albums in the same year, um, which is a difficult task to get, to get a band to do two albums in one year nowadays. Um, but, and then you have like Ezrin, who was more of a concept slash uh, to totalitarian uh, <laughs> controlling guy, <laughs> controlling guy, who Canadian, mind you, but he pushed the band to the limits. I mean, I remember reading an article where he said that Peter never sounded better than on Ooh. that album because he pushed him to means where he's never been pushed before. Mm -hmm. and, and, but then again, look at, look at Kramer too. He, he, created that whole life thing right okay it was overdubbed we know that but it refined it 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 it, it boosted their career when definitely that live album came out and uh, it created that magic right absolutely well we're going to get deeper into the topics yeah. then it's this it's this is a beautiful discussion we're going to have Pask, what do you think about uh, uh what we're going to be talking about today no i i love this topic just because what these two producers um contributed to history was was incredibly huge uh, and it's interesting the dichotomy between the two you have kramer who is in my opinion a back to basics guy and then you have uh ezrin who is the the over the top let, let's let's push the limits of the band and um that's going to be my recurring theme i think throughout this talk is that that those differences between the two and really what it brought what it, what it brought to the band because I've often said in this podcast, there's always changes with Kiss. They, they, they do one style to change another, one style change to another, you know? And I think Bob Ezrin and, and Eddie Kramer are the epitome of that. Yeah. They, you know, they, they, they shoot to the stars, bring them back. Shoot for the stars, bring them back. It's been their whole career. So I think, I think uh, Eddie and, and Ezrin really uh, define 
who Kiss is, in my opinion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Claudio? Yeah, well, you know, uh, as, as you just said, it's interesting that um, if, we, if we talk about music and the products, you know, the albums that these guys produced, they are iconic in, in history. But it's also interesting to mention, you know, the timeline. So Eddie Kramer, he was responsible to, you know, to do the first demos even before the first album came out. And then, you know, uh, a, a big responsible of, of making his a, a success with Alive. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, you know, the band decides to, to switch gears and go uh, and explore something, you know, new with, with Bob. Then Bob responsible also for a big failure with, with The Elder and a big comeback with uh, Revenge. And uh, so very interesting in the timeline also how these guys appear in very key moments in, in, in history and leaving you know their mark, which is undeniable. Yeah. So yeah, very interesting. So quite excited. Yeah. On to you, Pask. Okay, so let's get this started then. So, you know, I think we all have to agree that, you know, Eddie Kramer, let's start with Eddie, um, is a rock icon, right? I mean, for over five decades, Kramer has painted the rock landscape with his visual brush, working on some of music history's biggest names. So let me quote something describing Eddie Kramer. Any producer is only as good as the sights and sounds he helps create. So how do you feel about this quote? What do you think about this quote, Claudia? Well, I, I think um, I, I fully agree with the quote. You know, it's a, a producer to me, it's a, a, that person is an enabler, okay? So he needs to open the doors and open the space so that, you know, musicians can create and, uh, and he has to help with the sound. And, you know, Eddie being so technical, he, he was an engineer. Uh, he is an engineer, sorry. Um, he, was, he was paying ex extremely attention to the sound and, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the flavor, you know, and the color of the sound, not so much as, as, as Bob. But I, I can say that um, I think he helped Kiss uh, create a unique sound and uh, I think his mission, his mission was, was accomplished. You know, uh, I, again, as you said, you know, the quote says, any producer is only as good as the sound and sights he helps create. I think he did it fantastically with, uh, with Kiss. Okay, Craig? Yeah, I think um, he was the captain of the ship and, and to direct Kiss where it went, um, definitely putting a stamp on the Kiss sound. And uh, I mean, when I listen to those albums, I just know those those series of albums. When I hear them, they're they're all Eddie Kramer. I can tell. Mm -hmm. And when you listen to the other ones, you you see the influence of the other producers in it. But uh, no, definitely, I, I agree a thousand percent with that statement. Yeah, Patrick. Yeah, I think uh, Eddie Kramer was kind of like the guy who. It was like the glue that held it together, meaning that uh, I think, um, you know, he helped because Kiss, if you listen to recordings of before they recorded an album, they were, they were loose. I mean, they, they were good, but they were a little loose. Now this guy comes along and says, okay, I'm going to direct them a little bit. And he already had a lot of experience that guy under his belt. I mean, he had produced Jimi Hendrix and uh, he was even at the Woodstock Festival. So it gives you an idea of this guy, he knew what he was doing and he was very meat and potatoes. I don't think he, he had like uh, grandiose ideas. It was just like, okay, let's take this band, bring the best out of them, but stay true to who they are. Mm. Ask, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, okay, so the quote is, any producer is only as good as a sights and sounds it helps create. I think that's true of many producers, but I think in terms of KISS, I think any producer is as good as what changes he or she brings to the table. Uh, because I think Kramer was well aware of the Kiss sound and he wasn't trying to change the band. He was trying to keep them true to who right. they were, right? A great example is uh, Paul. He produced Sonic Boom and Monster. Didn't go over so well with the fans. And he's in the band for 50 years. He should know the band really well, you know? Mm -hmm. and. He, he couldn't do what Kramer does, go back to the style that is Kiss. Yeah. Because Paul is always trying to redefine himself, redefine the band. That's the model of the band throughout their career. 
But Kramer says, okay, guys, what was your original vision? Okay, so this is your vision. Now let's work with that and bring back the glory that was Kiss. I think that's the magic that is, uh, that is Eddie Kramer. And that's what he's brought to the band and, and their music. Great point, great point. So now, uh, you know, the next, uh, the next one is kind of similar. You know, it's, it sounds almost like the same question, but, but it's not. So Eddie has often said that his main function is to kind of uh, interpret, you know, the, the artist's vision and give them the, the sonic palette to help them uh, realize their dreams. So he, as, as we said before, he, he seems to be more like, a, a, like a, an enabler, okay? And he quotes, if I can make that happen, then I have done my job as a producer and as a therapist. So do you think that he was able to achieve these goals with the band? You know, having, you know, four strong personalities. Do you think that uh, he was able to achieve the goals with Kiss, uh, Craig? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the, the latter part of that sentence saying as a therapist, geez, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, there's a lot of personalities to deal with there. I mean, there's a lot of uh, things to to work out with those guys. I mean, you had to treat each one differently and then, and, you know, cater to their needs or whatever the case may be. So on that one, I tip my hat to them because uh, it must not have been fun. Um, but you know, on those, uh, he, did, he did get those Kiss staple albums out there. So as a producer, yeah, I think he did. They, they did get that Kiss sound. But as a therapist, I think it was it was a, it was a tricky thing, and you know, great job to him. <laughs> yep, yep. Pat. Yeah, I think he played the role as a therapist, as Crick said, uh, because I think it must not have been easy to work with the, with the four of them. Uh, but uh, unless there are things we don't know, aside maybe from side four of a like two, he used only the guys in the band to record. Mm -hmm. Unlike Ezrin and other people, he was able to have the original guys play all the time. So he had a pretty strong influence on the band. Probably as strong as Ezrin, but in a different way. And I think he got along good with Ace, so that helped a lot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, he was a therapist for sure, because it was probably, yeah, four guys who were, who were really hungry to make the band happen, and they wanted to make it. So... Uh, I would have been, I would have loved to be a fly on the wall. No, oh, yeah, well, me yeah. too. <laughs> Fast, what do you think? So obviously as a producer, I, uh, he definitely achieved his goals and, and then some with the band that goes, that goes without saying, and I'll say it again. I'll keep repeating it throughout this podcast. The magic of, uh, of, of, Ezra, of uh, Kramer, sorry, is to bring back kiss to their basics. Now, how do you do that as well? Right. In terms of, in terms of therapy, you know, if you want something, you need to understand yourself and what your needs and what your, and, and, and what your wants are. And if you understand yourself, then you can be a better, a better artist and create better music. And I think that's what, uh, what, what Kramer did with the band, help the band better understand who they were as people and as musicians, and then to use that creatively to create music. Now, I've got no, I got no, I have no facts about this. It's, it's, it's conjecture, it's, my, it's an opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we we know that uh, you know uh, we went through through uh, through history and we know what happened with uh, Destroyer that uh, we're going to touch on that later on. You know, we're going to talk about Bob, but then there there must have been a reason why, and I think it's more than the music why the band wanted to come back uh, to work with uh, with Ed, with Eddie, and I think the main reason was to kind of put the band together again. Because uh, as, as Pat said, you know, he got along great with, with Ace and, and Peter, which was not the case with uh, Bob Etherin. So, he, you know, as, as a therapist, I think uh, he did a fantastic job uh, as a producer, no doubt. So no, no discussion there. But um, I think uh, he's, he's responsible of keeping the band together. Uh, there were a lot of uh, issues when they recorded Destroyer and uh, he was able to, to, to bring the band together with, uh, with Rock and Roll Over and, and Love Gun. And actually, I think that was the pinnacle of, of, the, of the band. So then after that, you know, uh, it came uh, 
the biggest show ever and uh, alive too and all of that so and, and actually he he took a, a significant part of on on album on on aces uh, um, solo album too so uh no doubt that uh, he's a big part of history and he has a, a strong a strong uh, bond with uh, with the with the band members definitely okay i'm curious to what you guys think about this next question because you know kramer's philosophy compared to ezra is very different he loved experimenting with the technology and the sounds and use that as part of the, as part of the creative process as opposed to just using it when it was time to mix the album so do you find um, such experimenting more on the studio albums or on the Alive albums? Patrick? Uh, you know, I always found that Eddie Kramer's produce sing, I mean, the sound was very meat and potatoes. So I'm trying to, you know, I try to, to listen to how much he experienced, I think. I, you know, compared to Ezra, uh, do I hear any kind of uh, experimenting? I'm not so sure. I think with Alive, though, he was able to, because we all know it's been doctored, uh, he was able to give it the live feel, and it pretty, make, pretty much gave you the idea that what was going on. So in a sense, yeah, that experiment was really, really good. Better than Alive 2, actually. Uh, like too, you can tell that it's bits Much. and pieces. Uh, yeah. it, it's not their true order of what went on on that tour. Whereas Alive is a little more, uh, you know, coherent with what was really happening. So, in a sense, yeah, the, the experience with Alive was really there. Okay, Claudia. Well, I tend to I tend to think that because of what happened with Alive, I could go with. Uh, with um, I find that experimenting more present on on the on the alive albums. Uh, however, um, we have to remember what he did with Rock and Roll Over, which was something unique and fantastic. You know, they basically recorded the album in an empty theater, and they he was putting microphones in the in the in in the corridors, and he was placing the drums in the very center of the of the uh, of the theater to make it sound you know round and uh, everywhere so that's why you hear those drums everywhere basically in rock and roll over love gun it's it's more a meat and potatoes same as as uh, aces album but what he did with alive one he had, it's unprecedented you know the the stuff that he did you know recording the audience putting you know uh, almost uh, flying microphones all over the place, and then mixing all of that with uh, with the raps from Paul, and uh, and then uh, the the overdubbing that we all know that he did. You can you can now we know what what happened, but it's a perfect album. So to me, all that experimenting and 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 technology that he applied on on mainly on a live one, it's amazing to me. It's it's a it's a real, it's a scientific uh, job what he did, actually. Okay, Greg. Yeah, I, I really agree with uh, with Pat and Claudio on this one. Um, I, I did see some some footage of him when he was uh, redubbing of Alive and how he would turn up the audience's um, screams and singing along with the songs to make it sound like they were really uh, more involved in the show, right? And with the live ones like that, I found that I was a part of the concert when I read when I heard those those things. You know, it was it was boosted more um, than than I expected, which uh, I think created their popularity a lot more because people are saying, "Who are who, who are these guys?" You know, and stuff like that. A live too, yeah, Pat, you're right. I mean, it wasn't as dubbed as much, mm -hmm. um, but there, you know, we all know that there's a lost the lost two live out where there's a couple of songs that are not in there and some songs that were. Were studioed and uh, and they were dubbed in right so but um no i think uh when it comes to soundboarding and uh creative stuff like that i think he's top notch yeah Pask. okay I, again i i don't see i don't see kramer as the experimenter type uh we've often said that he's he he's a back to basics guy that's 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 his focus when you're experimenting you basically ask yourself okay what can i do different 
And I think it's the opposite with him. How can we bring it back to the basics? And a good example of that, I think, is the uh, A Solo album, right? We we're talking about him as a therapist. He brought out the best in Ace because he allowed Ace to be Ace freely. And that's why he came out with such an amazing album uh, because he wasn't asked to fit a particular mold like he does in Kiss. He's asked to be Ace freely. Yeah. And, 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 and that's something that Kramer brought out in him. And, and, and that's basic Ace freely. That's why the album was so popular. So in terms of the studio albums, I, Pat, I agree. I don't see any experimenting there. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking necessarily about the sound quality of the albums. We're talking about the production of the songs, of the music. Now, how can I, how can I, how can I say this? The Alive albums, I don't see that as experimenting either, although I'm quite aware that what he did with Alive One was unprecedented. It was never, it was never done before. It was, it was different. It was out there for the time. But what was he doing? He was bringing Kiss back to the basics, what Kiss is live. And it's interesting, if you look at Alive 1, Alive 2, and Alive 3, it's mm -hmm. basically a chronicle of Kiss at that time. Alive 1 was basic Kiss at that time. Alive 2 was basic Kiss. Alive 3, basic Kiss. And I dare say, you know, if you don't like, for example, Alive 3, maybe you don't like Kiss at that era, during that era. And if you like Kiss in Alive 2, well, maybe you prefer that era. Why? Because that is quintessential Kiss. And that's what Kramer brought out in yeah. that. Yeah, super. Yeah, you got it. Uh, you got it. It is true, man. You know, that, again, I, I'm repeating myself, but, you know, I love uh, when you say those kind of things, uh, past, because now if you listen to Alive 3, it, it is a representation uh uh, of of what Kiss was at that time, it, yeah. and it, and he was able to capture that, and you know th that's not easy. I'm telling you to 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 make a, an alive album that actually captures the sound and and the vibe of the band at that time, with a band that has changed so many times. <laughs> it is not easy. Mm -hmm. It is not easy. Yeah. It is not easy. Go super. So um, now uh, we're moving on into uh, uh, super producer. You know that that's. That's what it's often used when discussing Bob Etheren. And I think with a good reason. So after all, the Toronto native has been behind the boards of many classic albums. You know, amongst them, uh, we find uh, Alice Cooper's uh, Billion Dollar Babies, Destroyer from Kiss, and The Wall from Pink Floyd. So both Eddie and, and Bob, uh, no doubt that they have worked with tier one music uh, acts. So what do you think are the main differences, if any, between the two? Pask, I, I would like to start with you. This okay, time. Um, big differences. Um, again, you want to shake things up, you call Ezrin. You want to go back to basics, you call Kramer. Things are getting stale, the music sounds the same, fans are getting bored, call Ezrin, and for sure, he'll take the band to the next level. And he definitely did that with Destroyer. Now, the band went stale in the 80s. What did we do? We called Ezrin. <laughs> it didn't quite work out. Hello, the elder. Okay. Um, but Kramer knows how to realize a band's vision and to maintain that vision throughout. So I want to leave you with this. Um, Who would be the best producer at the beginning of Kiss's career? Would it be Kramer or would it be Ezrin? Um, you want the band to last? You, to go beyond their programming, you call Ezrin. That's my take. Good point. Wow. Wow. <laughs> oh, this, I think this is going to be a long discussion today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Patrick, what do you think? The difference between the two? Um, yeah. I think, uh, as I said a little earlier, I think Eddie Kramer took the band and said, okay, I'm not going to change them or I'm going to push them to be themselves. Where Ezrin gets them out of their comfort zone. And I think also Ezrin, I got to give him props. He, you know, every artist, as some, uh, some producer said, they all believe they have a Sergeant Pepper within them. And I think in some ways, Ezrin was able to bring out the Sergeant Pepper and kiss with the elder. Uh, not the elder, I'm sorry. With Destroyer. Destroyer, sorry. Hmm. So 
it helped them become a better band. And with that, okay, let's get back to our roots. Now we're a better band. He pushed them to be a little better. So in a sense, that's what, that was Ezra's role. With a Kramer, it's like, okay, let's stay meat and potatoes, but, uh, you know, let's, let's make a little, make it a little more meaner. So mm-hmm. to speak, although revenge was kind of heavy too. Oh yeah. But um, yeah, Ezrin is a little more grandiose, if I can use that. And I think he wanted with the other. He wanted. He was just off the uh, uh, the wall trip, and I think he wanted to bring that to Kiss. And of course, that didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Pink Floyd is Pink Floyd, and Kiss is Kiss. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Craig, what's your take on this one? I think Pat said it all. I mean, it's. Uh it's definitely hit the nail on the head for me it's just dealing with multiple personalities and how you how you can produce them and like he says you know in the beginning it was let kiss be kiss during those kramer years and just direct direct them whereas in with uh, with ezrin it was this is the vision i have and you're buying it and then we're moving on right okay the elder was it was a blip but i but i still think the elder was a album that would probably be appreciated more today than then it was too progressive for them at that time yeah you know and if they would have done the whole production with the film and everything afterwards i i don't know i'm just you're saying maybe it would have been more popular later on in their career where it had a time and place but anyway like i said um definitely it's it's all about i mean these guys have worked with some of the major uh tough heads in, in, in the industries, right? They've they've made made bands popular. They've dealt with all kinds of people, and I think Kiss is no different. I just think that they're they're more um, uh, their personalities and stuff like that. They they all have their own, and I'm sure other bands have the same thing. But like I said, exactly what what Pat was saying, and I'm just elaborating on it. But uh, he, he hit it on the head. There. Okay. Okay. Well, in my case, um, I have to say, uh, are there uh, differences? Definitely. Uh, but we're talking about two top-notch producers, okay? Working with uh, number one, you know, bands and artists. But I, I do see big differences. You know, I, you know what happens to me when I listen to, um, for instance, Destroyer? And I'm not talking about the music. To me, I can visualize the guys playing. You know, to me, Estrin, he created the characters. He created the spaceman. He created, you know, the demon. Uh, when you listen to songs like God of Thunder or, or Detroit Rock City with the flamenco solo there in the middle, or, you know, he's responsible for writing Beth, you know, with, with, with Peter. So. And that doesn't happen to me with with uh, with uh, Eddie. Eddie, I you know I, I love uh, Alive and I love Rock and Roll Over and Love Gun, but to me they are not cinematic. Uh, you know what I what I find with Ethrin, it's that they, those albums they have a, a life on on its own. Even with uh, with the Elder, you know now we value more the Elder than what than when it came out. But um, look. What uh, what we got with uh, with uh, ancient door, you know? Uh, can you imagine if 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 Fethrin could have done something like that, or maybe if he if he could have given the freedom to do something like that, we you know we we could be flying with that album. Yeah. So the, to me, the, 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 those are the main differences. You know, more Eddie, you know, more technical guy, more engineer, more sound. You know, he captured Kiss sound. And uh, Ethrin, he took the band to another level to me. Okay, so we talked about this before. You know, Ezrin is well known for having his vision uh, for something, and he would work hard to make that vision happen on the artist. So we all agree that a producer should have some kind of input, right? But should that input be as much as Ezrin, for example, especially for something as Destroyer? Is there such a thing as giving too much input. Do you think that Ezrin's approach had a positive result on the album, Destroyer, for example? Craig? Yeah, I do. I, I do think that they needed that discipline. I, did, I do need the need to be pushed to their limits to be better musicians and better people. 
Um, I, I definitely think that, um, I mean, those, those albums, I mean, they're parts of the set list, right? It's, 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 it's half the album is on the set list, right? So it's, uh, I, I, I think that, no, no, definitely that was the approach they needed at the time. Okay, Pat? Yeah, probably they needed that also because as I said, they had produced three first albums that were, that did okay or mediocre at best. They needed, they were at that point where they needed something a little more grandiose to prove to people that, hey, you know, we, we really can play. Now, the little downside of it is that it created cracks within the band. That would have happened probably a little later on, but I think early in the process, I think Ace and Peter not getting along with Bob Ezrin is the dark side of it. Uh, having said that, they were able to produce the record anyways, and even Peter said that he, he liked the fact that Ezra pushed him to be a better drummer on that record. Yeah. So in the end, yeah, I, they needed that. I don't think every album should be produced by Bob Ezra, but yeah. to have him go there and, you know, shake them a little bit. So, okay, now you can go on your own. I did my job. Yeah. Okay. Claudio? Yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, as Pat was saying, uh, the band needed that. And uh, let's let's uh, let's remember that when, when Alive came out, uh, basically the band, you know, they, they hit uh, the jackpot. But it was a kind of a it was fortune. So they were pushing, they were playing, they were you know busting their asses trying to make it happen. But they didn't know where to go musically. They the band didn't have any direction. They were, they were failing, uh, you know, before Alive. Uh, you know, they couldn't make it happen with uh, Harder Than Hell. They couldn't make it happen with the, uh, with Dress to Kill. So then they were desperate and they get to Bob and Bob, you know, he, he puts his discipline there and he writes songs with them. You know, he puts all the arrangements and everything and he makes an album that it's, you know, uh, stands today as one of the best. To me, uh, yeah, pushing his vision uh, against maybe what the band wanted, I think that was the right approach. And uh, Paul and Gene, they seemed to follow what Bob was saying to the T. Uh, a little bit of a hard time with uh, with Ace and Peter, but as usual, you know, as, uh, that's part of history. But I think that's what the band needed at that time, definitely. Okay. Past, now, what about you? Now the question is, do you think this approach has a positive result on Destroyer? Uh, yeah. ab absolutely it's it's undeniable because that's what kiss needed at that time but i think ezrin is someone that should be called when needed i agree with pat not every album should be a bob ezrin uh, yeah. bob ezrin album it, it wouldn't work do you think that if he did rock and roll over it would have worked i i don't think so mm -hmm. someone someone like kramer was definitely needed um, for that album as a follow-up to destroyer uh, Ezrin, Ezrin wouldn't be able to pull that one off. Um, now, I want to leave you with another, another question with this. Now, I think that Ezrin would be a better producer if he had the elements of Kramer, but I don't think Kramer would be a better producer if he had Ezrin's qualities. Good point. Let that, let, let that one soak in. Mm. That's true. That's true. That's Deep true. Thought. Yeah, Deep thought. Yeah, 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 yeah. For sure. Oh man, you did your homework, man. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, Bob and, and he pushing his vision to the bands, every band that he worked on, not only Kiss, you know, he did the same thing with Alice Cooper, you know, he did the same thing with Pink Floyd, Aerosmith, uh, you name it. But um, let's, let's take as an example, bringing session musicians. And we know that in the case of KISS, that created some conflict within the band members, okay? On top of the strict discipline that he wanted to apply, uh, you know, to the camp, as he called it. So, however, we just said that it is undeniable that uh, his extreme demand uh, upscales the musicianship of the band. So, now we're not talking about only Destroyer, but was the was the balance positive in the case of his work with Kiss? You know, the, uh, the Elder Destroyer Revenge. Was it positive, Patrick? 
Uh, you mean being positive in the sense that if it brought something good, well, I think so. Okay. I think so. Uh, you know, as much as I am a huge fan of Ace and Peter, and I think in a way, like with Destroy, it was like, okay, you don't want to do it. Well, we'll bring somebody in when the job needs to be done. So I think it was a certain, uh, certain way of saying, you need to do this. And it has to be done now, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, and there's no there's no room because I, I think by destroy the band had gotten a lot bigger, so they needed to they couldn't afford to mess around too much. So yes, it was positive because even the other it has its moments, you know. And revenge, I think, has a huge place in many fans' heart. Mm -hmm. So it was positive, yes, because again, revenge. I think he took the approach of destroyer. You know, yeah. we need to bring back Kiss to what it is. So ironically, he had the same approach as uh, Eddie Kramer in the sense that let's do it meat and potatoes, but musically better. Yeah, well, the but band yes, it's positive. Do you know the band with with uh, Eric and Bruce ne never sounded as tight as yeah. as with uh, with uh, revenge? Totally. Fask, well, what's your take on this one? So, Ezrin tries to push his vision of the band by having the band realize his vision. Yeah. And I, and I think that's definitely a positive thing because it only makes the band better. The trouble, though, is that he does that at any cost. And by any cost, I mean bringing in session players. Now, is bringing in session players such a bad thing? All right. So people had an issue with Psycho Circus because the original four weren't playing on it. Hmm. Were the original four playing on all the songs of Destroyer? No. But that wasn't, but the original, the originals were there. That was the original era, but not everybody was playing. So why do people have an issue with Psycho Circus and not an issue with, with uh, Destroyer? So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you want to make an album work. You do what it takes to make that album work to realize your vision for the band. And I think, again, when it's necessary, it's necessary. And for Destroyer, it definitely was necessary. For Revenge, same thing. It was definitely necessary. Awesome. Craig? I think it's a two-bladed two uh, sword there where I, I think that there was a need for session players especially on like an album like The Elder, where it's like, it's really out of their, their realm to play some music like that. But mind you, um, Paul and Gene, I think we're still on it, but Peter and, uh, not Peter, but uh, Eric and, uh, and Ace weren't, weren't on it, right? And um, I don't think they're musically, they were musically inclined to do it at the time. I don't think that they were good enough, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, um, but I do think that it does make them a better musician if they see someone come in and take their place and it, it just kind of teaches them that, Hey, you know what? I'm replaceable. Um, we don't want it to happen, but uh, on the other hand, like, but, but mind you, like, like Paps was saying Psycho Circus. Yeah. They, they probably didn't play on Psycho Circus, but all of a sudden they can play it live, right? Like Ace and Peter can play the song. So it can be learned. It's just that, I don't think at the time they, they wanted to learn it or they, they wanted to learn it, right? So, or they had other priorities or whatever the case may be. But uh, no, definitely. I mean, that approach definitely was good. So then uh, was, was the balance positive uh, in the case of uh, his work with Kiss? Definitely. You know, if I, if, if I put aside for a while, you know, the, the, the discipline and, and, and using the, uh, you know, different musicians uh, replacing the, the band members. If I just take the album as a product and I put it on my turntable, CD, whatever you want to put it, and I listen to Destroyer, The Elder, and Revenge, those are three great albums. Um, they, they, you know, they stand out in, in history. Uh, it's, there's no denial that... Uh, Kiss would, would, wouldn't be the same without uh, Destroyer, uh, The Elder, and, and, and Revenge. So from that, from that perspective, you know, him being the producer, if you have a great product, you know, the job is done. Then 
we know all the minutia and we know, we know all the behind the scenes stuff, which makes it more interesting. Uh, but to me, you know, uh, his his contribution and the balance was uh, more than positive with Kiss, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So I want to go back to a discussion we had on Sonic Boom and Monster from a previous uh, discussion panel. <laughs> now, these were obviously Kiss's final two albums or last two albums. Mm -hmm. And Monster, chances are, uh, more than not, that it'll be their last album of their career. Now, with both these albums, Kiss wanted to, to go back to their roots, to, to create their bombastic sound. So the obvious question here is, what would happen if either Kramer or Ezrin had been chosen to produce these albums? Hmm. Okay, Claudia? Well, I, I can say that uh, to me, either uh, Eddie or Bob, they, they could have made those albums sound better uh, in terms of sound. Now there's great songs, you know, on both, uh, on both albums, but I would have loved to, because now we know what's, what Sonic Boom is, you know, and the songs that, that we can find there, but I would have loved to have Eddie to produce Sonic Boom and Bob to produce Monster. Because I, I don't know why, and I think I told you that before, I find that this strange connection between some of the songs in Monster with Revenge. If I think, I'm sure that if Bob had produced Monster, it could have been a phenomenal album. Phenomenal. Interesting. Okay. Pat? Yeah. Uh, I definitely, I always said, whoever it is, I think a band should not produce itself. Therefore, I think uh, Sonic Boom and Monster required someone from the outside. Um, now, it's funny that you say, Claudio, that uh, Ezrin should have produced Monster because I think it's only an opinion. I think it should have been actually Kramer, in my opinion, because I it's pretty much a meat and potatoes album, that record. So therefore, I think Kramer is better suited for that. I think with uh, Monster, he may have tried to put something a little grandiose, which could have worked out. Hey, you never know. Maybe in the end, Ezrin could have been suited for the job as well. But for some reason, I, I picture more uh, Kramer. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, but either way, I think a producer should be there. Although, opinion again, I was not too happy with the production from Crazy Nights, but. Okay, yeah. well, with uh, with Nevison, okay. Yeah, good okay. producer, just not well suited for Kiss. Mm -hmm. All right, Craig? Here's where I'm going to disagree with you guys. <laughs> I, I think neither of them, because I, I just think that at that time, of those albums, Kiss was uh, a legend. And I think that their their egos would have stood in the way and it would have blocked either of them trying to get across what the, they wanted to do as a producers. Um, maybe not so much Eric and Tommy because they just go with the flow, but Gene and, uh, Gene and Paul definitely um, are very high on themselves at that time. And uh, they're not in a negative way. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that I think that they thought they could do a better job. And maybe they should have went with someone brand new, not a brand new, but someone else who, who produced some other popular albums. And cheaper, uh, and cheaper too. And, and cheaper, maybe. <laughs> you could have asked me, but anyway. Good point. Um, but <laughs> I'm just saying that that's, that's my take on it. I think that uh, it just egos would have gotten away, I think. Pusk. All right, guys. So sit back, have a coffee, relax. This is tomatoes, be... tomatoes no, 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 now. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> this, is gonna be, this is gonna be long winded, long winded. <laughs> Okay, so I believe that both Kramer and Ezrin would have done an equally great job producing these albums. The question is not who will do the better job, it's who would be needed at the time of the release of Sonic Boom and Monster, okay? okay. So let's look at these, let's look at a few scenarios. So first of all, scenario number one, Kiss hasn't released an album in 20 years. What do you think the fans want? A back to basics album. Let's call Kramer. And let's keep Kiss consistent. And the second album is also going to be produced by Kramer. So Kiss ends their, their career um, back to basics. Okay. Scenario number two. Kiss has, Kiss has released a multitude of albums. And maybe fans want to hear something different. So let's call Ezrin. So Ezrin produces uh, Sonic Boom. Let's keep it consistent. Ezrin produces um, Monster. Monster. 
what do you think the fans are going to say? Well, you know, this isn't Kiss. I, I, I want a, a back to basics Kiss. So the same thing would happen with scenario number three, right? Again, Kiss hasn't released an album in 20 years. So let's bring it back to the basics, Kramer. And now, Claudio, I'll disagree with you here. Now, for the next one, you want to do something different, right? Let's call in Ezra. What do you think fans are going to say? Oh, we're, they'd be disappointed because they want a back to basics kiss. Mm. And the same would be for the fourth scenario. So call Ezra for something completely different after Psycho Circus, right? Um, what, do you think, what do you think will happen? Fans are going to want to like, they go back to basics. Do you see the pattern here? Yeah. In my opinion, Kramer would do the better job and what's needed at the time for both Sonic Boom and Monster. Hmm. Oh, that was long. Wow. Wow. <laughs> Look, I have nothing to say. You got it all. So, uh, yeah, all the different combinations. Uh, I have <laughs> nothing else to say. That's, right. That's right. <laughs> this is good. This is good. Now, you know, it is, it is tough because now we're talking after the fact because we know what kind of songs we have on Monster and what kind of songs we have on Sonic Boom. And that's how I took this question. That's why I said, you know, well, Eddie for the first one, Monster for, uh, uh, and Bob for the second one. But you're right. So if those albums hadn't exist, you know, um, we, we didn't know what they were at that time. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe Eddie um, could be, could be taken as, as the guy who actually kept the, uh, the kiss sound, you know, until the end. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, true. Wow. Okay. Look. So now uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's play now. Let's uh, time for a game. Let's uh, let's see what happens here. So if we if we consider the first demos as an album or EP, whatever you want to call it. So Eddie produced three studio albums with Kiss demos. You know, uh, Rock and Roll Over and Love. Girl. In a similar way, Bob produced another three, Destroyer, Elder, and Revenge. So can you create your own album by selecting the songs you like the most from those six albums? 10 songs, 11 songs, whatever you want. Let's see who wins. Mm. Patrick. Um, demo, of course, we need Strutter, and I think we need Deuce, so that's already two. Uh, studio, uh, like, off uh, Rock and Roll Over, I'm gonna have to do at least one Rock and Roll Over. We need a Peter song, Baby Driver. Now, I know that's a bit odd, but, um, Love Gun, we need Shot Me and Ace Song. After that, Bob Ezrin, we need uh, off uh, Rock and Roll Over. We have, we need, uh, not Rock and Roll oh, Over, Destroyer, sorry, Destroyer rather. Uh, Flaming Youth and Sweet Pain. The Elder, The Oat. And probably off uh, Revenge, I would say Unholy. Unholy. So you're at eight now. Okay, I, I'm allowed two more songs. Let's say uh, Off Revenge, Take It Off, and Spit. Bob Ezrin wins. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of odd because I prefer Kramer, but... <laughs> That's <laughs> right. That's why I wanted to play this <laughs> game, you know? <laughs> All right, good. Thank you. Task. Okay, you're going to kill me. <laughs> so, listen, okay. I racked my brain... You put it in a box hit. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Okay, listen, I racked my brains over this one and I don't want to be accused of not doing my homework. I didn't do my homework. Okay, let's do it now. No, 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 no. I'm not doing my homework and I refuse to do it. Wow. I'll, I'll tell what, you why. What is this? I'll Rainbow. tell you why. I'll tell you why. It cannot be done. Because you're, you're asking for, for an album of Ezrin songs and, and, and Kramer songs, right? Yeah. yeah. So let's try to come up with a good Kiss album. What do you think is going to happen? We're going to come out with a mishmash of songs, an album yeah. with no direction. Um, and, and that's going to be the critique from, from, from Kiss fans. Now, if I were to answer this question and come up with these 10 songs, after everything I've said in this podcast, I'd, I'd, I'd be a hypocrite. 
because we're talking two styles here. We're talking it back to basics, meat and potatoes, and let's try and let's try something new, right? So you put that together in an album, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have a mess. You're gonna you're gonna you're yeah, gonna it's have gonna a mess, be a mess. Well, there, there's there's many albums where but it's a mess. fun mess. <laughs> <laughs> there are many <laughs> albums. Okay, where but so you're ask, gonna okay. get lines after school. But but let, but let me ask you this: Is that the kind of Kiss album you you'd want to listen to? Well, maybe not, maybe not, but you know, but, but maybe for the sake of, of, of the exercise, uh, well, you know, maybe, um, yeah, true. It's not going to be cohesive. It's not going to be, it's not going to have a flow, but uh, look, uh, there's so many albums in history that doesn't have, uh, that they, they are not theme, uh, theme albums, right? So, right, uh, but this is why I love this question because it really speaks to the differences between, between Kramer and Ezrin. Yeah. There's two different styles that yeah. just don't mix. It's, it's a matter of when are these producers needed at a given time in history. Okay, good. That's so, my uh, answer. You're so we're going to name good. it the best of Ezrin and Kramer years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the greatest, uh, the greatest uh, Eddie Bob uh, collection. Right. Eddie Bob. <laughs> Okay, Craig. So I, I hope you're not taking the same the same road as. Oh no, I had day. fun with this one. I had rocking out all day. Nice. Um, <laughs> I I I went for a double album because I on my I'm always wanted to. Oh all right, good. All right. So I started off with Deuce and Strutter demos. Then I had I Want You, off of our R A R O, and then I had Take Me, Mr. Speed. Nice. Uh, off Love Gun, I had Got Love for Sale, Almost Human, and I Stole Your Love. Then I had off Destroyer, uh, Detroit Rock City, King of the Nighttime World, Flaming Youth. Wow. Uh, then I had for uh, Elder, I had I and Only You, which is probably one of my favorite Kiss songs. Then off Revenge, I had Unholy, Heart of Chrome, and Paralyzed. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my bonus disc was Sweet Pain and Under the Rose. How many songs do you have in there? It's uh, so 18. Wow. And did you did you uh did you count how many Ezrin and how many Kramer? No. I think it was more Ezrin. Okay. Yeah. But don't forget that's the European version as well with bonus tracks. Right, okay. okay. <laughs> look, look, Basque is laughing. He's like, no, it doesn't make any sense. This this uh... <laughs> You gotta make it fun. Absolutely, it. absolutely. I love it. I love it. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up. I uh, I um I picked uh, uh, Strider demo, uh, no doubt. Then I went uh, Detroit Rock City, God of Thunder, shout it out loud. Uh, love Gun, I stole your love. Uh, uh, take me, Mr. Speed, uh, from uh, from Rock and Roll Over. Then. Uh, uh, the Elder, I picked uh, Only You and The Oath, uh, two songs that I love. And then uh, just to wrap it up, um, I Just Wanna and uh, Heart of Chrome. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, a little bit uh, close, close, but a little bit more of, uh, of Ethereum than, than Kramer. But uh, now I feel bad about this question. We should edit and we cut it. <laughs> We, we remove it from the No, from no, the it, was, it was awesome. No, <laughs> it's all good. Great question. Great all question. Good. No, but it's but it's true. You know, as I was writing down the, the, the songs, I was thinking like, no, this is uh it's it's not cohesive, you know, it doesn't it doesn't work together. They're they're so different. They're so different. But that's exactly the point. Yeah, that is exactly yeah, yeah, the yeah. point. And yeah. really it really brings up the differences between these two producers. Yeah. And, and it's funny because, you know, we always say that, you know, it's and still Kiss, you know, so yeah. Kiss gave us so many different yeah. things that it's, uh, I don't think any other band did that, you know, so. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, guys, this has been such a, an amazingly fun discussion, man, really so much fun. And, uh, you know, I um, want to wrap it up with one final question, just because can't get enough of this. Um, mm. If Kiss were to record a new album, who would you pick as producer? Greg, I would definitely go Ezrin, uh, just for his uh, disciplined approach. Um, also, getting most of the musicians' talent to, to, to take out that that talent uh, to go that extra step. Vision to stick to what they're what they're going to get, and also different sounds and lyrics. 
I think that the lyrics are a little deeper with with the Ezran songs that they're not just party songs, you know. Um, I mean, some of them are. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, the, definitely the outside influencing of the of the writing and stuff like that is. Yeah, you got to make a good thing better sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Pat. Probably, I think, for the very reasons you, Pascal, said a little earlier, I think if they were to record a new album, okay, we need Ezra because we need something uh, new in a sense that uh, I would say that Sonic Boom and uh, Monster are sort of like sister records, just like uh, Rock and Roll Over and uh, Love Gun. I think if they were to bother doing a new record, probably Ezra, it the timing would be good to say, okay, let let me bring the best out of you, especially that since that lineup has been together for a long time, maybe he could do, uh, he could produce something interesting for sure. Okay, Claudio? I, I could go with, uh, with Bob, um, even though it's uh, risky, okay, because we don't know what, what can happen. But if I take out of the three albums that he created with Kiss, if we consider, you know, the, the circumstances around the elder, okay, which was uh, like a misstep in, in history, uh, both Destroyer and, and Revenge, they are fantastic albums. So to me, to put the cherry on the pie, I would love, you know, the band to, to wrap up, uh, you know, their catalog with a great album, you know, made by, uh, produced by, by Bob Ethrin, Death Ring. Okay. Past? Uh it's an interesting question because with Kiss's final album, if you want to get you, you want to get Ezrin, do you really want to experiment with Kiss's final album? It would be a, a, a hit and miss, right? Number one. Number two, you know, if Ezrin were to do the last album, why would it have to be something different? Wouldn't you want to go back to the basics for Kiss's final album? Because I feel that a Bob Ezrin produced album would be like having a movie with a sequel, but the sequel never comes out. You want to see more, but there is no more because it's the last movie. Mm. Or in this case, it's the last album. I would mm. really want Kramer just because I want to see Kiss um, back to who they were at the very beginning. It would be Kiss coming full circle. It would be a great completion to an amazing career. Do you think... Do you think that he's gonna be he he could be able to get the same kind of sound with uh, with Tommy and Eric instead of Ace and Peter? Because you know the, the 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 magic with Eddie Kramer was you know what he can get what well, what he could get out of Ace. So now uh, Eddie Kramer, you know uh, Tommy and Eric. Do you think that uh, he he could still be able to get the the kiss sound to wrap up uh, kiss story. That's a that's a great question. I think I think yes because going back to the to the um, um, therapist question, he would bring out the best of Eric and the best of Tommy. He would bring out who Tommy Thayer is and who Eric Singer is as people and as musicians in the band. And basically, what they've been doing for the last what twenty years or so is recreating as best they can the kiss sound. Yeah, you know. At the same time, with their own with their own styles, yes, more mm -hmm. Eric than Tommy, um, because they've been you know they've been told to to fit this particular mold. But if they were to basically be a little bit more themselves, um, and they know Kiss really well, in a sense like <clears throat> like Kramer does, yeah, I think they'd be able to pull off the um, that 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 original Kiss sound. Yeah. I okay. Think. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Well, great answer, uh, guys. Again, uh, this has been uh, awesome. We uh, it was a bit different from the other discussion panels, but I think it's uh, well worth it. You know, to explore more, uh, going deeper into the music. Uh, we didn't go into the technical details, which uh, we don't need to. But uh, two different styles, you know, Bob and Eddie. Uh, great contributions to history, and uh, thank you so much for. Uh, for your your opinions and and, and your uh, your answers. So uh, on to you, Pascal. Now, I, uh, you know, guys, thank you so much for uh, for doing this tonight. It's been uh, a lot of fun, a fantastic episode. And you know, I've been I've been um, taking notes um, before before the episode and preparing for the episode. And as I was taking the notes, I was really looking forward to this episode more and more because it's such 
uh, it's such an interesting topic. And like you said, Claudio, different from what we've done before in discussion panels. But I, 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 think, it's, I think it's important to look at you know, what happens behind the scenes uh, to make KISS a success that they are. You know, this is a team effort. You don't do this by them. KISS doesn't do this by themselves. There's so many people involved in oh, yeah. what they do. Mm -hmm. And let's acknowledge uh, these amazing people behind the scenes that make KISS so successful. Sure. Craig, Craig, what are your thoughts? No, definitely having it. Had a great time. Um, I've always loved the, uh, the different points of view and uh, the different uh, selling of, their, of our points to each other. <laughs> uh, but it's always, but it's always in respect and and, and trust, and it's it's really really fun. Um, lately, I'm looking forward to those Sam Loomis movies. Uh, <laughs> I just not noticed them today there, and um, I, I just saw something else too. I just wanted to do a little footnote. Was Gene was saying that he's looking forward to another hundred shows, right? Then I saw something today or yesterday online saying that um, yeah, I'm basically done. I can't do it. I can't go on. Yeah, I so thought that I'm confused. Yeah, <laughs> funny. I'm confused. Yeah, and uh, and, uh, and at the same time, I, I I think I read something about Paul uh, just on the opposite, you know, saying that 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 case will never end. So for you know, he has no he, control of what's happening at the end. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> then I was thinking, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> well, let's hope it never ends. <laughs> no, I wouldn't want it to end, but let's end it on a high if it's going to end. Yeah. yeah. If, it, if it's going to end because Gene can't do it anymore, that's not. You, you want to go out with a bang. Yeah. 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 For Patrick, sure. Patrick, final thoughts? Well, as uh, Craig was saying, I enjoy the discussions as well. What I enjoy most is listening to you three guys. And sometimes you bring out something I didn't think about and go, oh, wow, that's an interesting point of view. You know, I enjoy you know, hearing the different points of views and sometimes make, could make me not necessarily change my opinion and go, well, I didn't see it that way. So that's mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I love the most. Uh, you know, I really uh, sort of like, uh, I really sort of like not learn something new, but uh, consider uh, looking at things in a different point of view. So mm -hmm. very important for me. And that's what I enjoy the most. Thank you guys for showing up. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. So to the KISS Army, if you want to get involved with the KISS Army Nation podcast, send us your comments, questions, or ideas to talk to me at KISSArmyNationPodcast.com. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And remember, never stop rocking. Take care, everyone. If you enjoyed this episode, like and subscribe on YouTube or follow us on Spotify, Automatic, iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to make yourself heard. Leave us a comment on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. See you all soon, Kiss Army.